Let me start by going back to like just the, just the evolution of the media's uh, coverage of the economist of economics, but back to the beginning of our democracy. I think um, in the early days it was dominated by it's like the kind of like the direction that we were going to take, like and and almost all economic coverage was about whether gear is wrong or gear is correct, should we go this way, go that way, and 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 that's where and then the debate became very polarized, I mean, like around that and. And as and became a, and then a lot of and then sloganeering became the order of the day. I mean, like what, uh, and we in the media fell into that trap as well. And like and we, I don't think we were able to delve deep into I mean, like the pros and cons and the, and the actual nitty gritties of the policy options that were on the table and the policy directions that the government was taking and and why people, others were objecting to it. I mean, like we just. We were we, we we became conduit for sound bites, and then and I think as time moved along, um, things became a bit more just to use the word again a bit more sophisticated. I think um, everyone accepted that gear was the gear was here to stay, and one, and people started to see the effects of gear and the benefits and sometimes the not not so great benefits, and and I think that. Um, we then we got into the monetary policy debates, and then the charters were kicking in, uh, the, the empowerment charters, and there were lots of deals that were happening. And again, the media we were again just merely reporting on the deals and not actually analysing what, what these charters and these deals, wh which direction they were going to be taking the country in. Things things started to improve in the latter part of the big years, and I think we, there was a missed opportunity in terms of our coverage during that period. But then the whole notion of the developmental state started being discussed, and we didn't let on to that and actually kind of like build a more advanced conversation around the notion of the, the, the developmental state. I think instead we were again sidetracked by the pre bulukwane and post bulukwane happenings, and the politics was always sexier than actually the long-term direction of our economy. And um, having said that, I think there are some strengths that do exist in the South African media's coverage. I think we do have a decent level of company reporting. I think that people do actually, we have some very good company reporters in this country. It could be a lot better, but but you do get a sense if you open a South African newspaper or, or or listen to radio stations. You do get a sense of what, how decisions are being taken on a, at the corporate level. And then I think what we do do very well is the I think the interface between business and, and, and politics. And there it goes into the realm of I hate to say use the word, but I'm like it is a, the great C word, and that is corruption. I, mean, like, I think that that that's something that the South African media has been able to. To, to to delve into what we what we have not done with it though is to actually interpret it to say these are the effects on the economy Th these are the effects on the lives of, of people and we merely do it as like just this is wrongdoing but actually there's a there's a huge economic story that we could be telling better the another thing is uh, I think we provide the platform a great platform for the economic conversation. Um, right from the beginning, from the gear days, I think that not whereas it's, it may not be ourselves as journalists who are actually conducting the conversation, but I think the platform that we provide for the conversation is actually a very, very good platform, and and it does offer a broad range of views. Obviously, I think the private sector side is much more proactive in getting its views across, which, and I think the left is less. Uh, oh, you, you do get. A lot of left views. Um, if one needs to needs to juxtapose, but I don't think there is enough proactiveness, and um, is such a word, from the left in terms of getting the views into the newspapers and and, 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 and other media. But there are obviously lots of gaps, and I think Nick has gone into those. And and one is the real economy. We do very little in terms of covering the real economy, and and in that way. I mean, 
entrepreneurship, whether it's the guy at the corner selling this and that, or the the small business guy, and just the the things that people do, and we are very, very we are not there. You only get it when it's uh, you only get it in specialist magazines that are targeted at the small business sector. But actually, that story is not for the small businessman. That story is for the broader population. That story is for policymakers, and that story is for so. For everybody, and I don't think that we in the media actually have done that. You know, the, the nuts and bolts of the economy, and then also I think the we are not we have not actually told the story of inequality. We have not told the story of the gap. We have not told the story of how um, poverty is lived in South Africa, and we do celebrate. We, we, we celebrate well, and, that, and that's something that it's sexy. And, and so we, so if somebody has made it, I'm like my the newspaper I used to edit, and uh, which is in, 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 in our stable of newspapers, the Sunday Times. We run something called the Sunday Times Rich List, which basically is a celebration of yeah of wealth and celebration of riches. Um, some people find it. Not so comfortable, but I won't defend it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I started it. <laughs> it works. Um, and then, ex with, with very few exceptions, I think we should, we, we should do a lot more. We should be doing a lot more in terms of investigative journalism that goes into corporates. Government is easy to investigate because we get whistleblowers all the time. Um, and, and because government interfaces a lot with ordinary people, and so people do speak out. There is a lot more corporate shenanigans that happen in South Africa, with great cost of the economy, which we should definitely be delving into. Um, and then I think that, yeah, the, the reality is on the ground, and um, the, the people's stories about how the economy really affects people. Um, I think we should be doing a lot more, in terms of our role, we should be doing a lot more uh, in terms of um, monitoring state delivery, we should be doing a lot more in using what is what the data that is available from government. Think, and we can actually hold the government to account very strongly. Just using purely what is on various government websites, whether it's DTI or whatever. But like there is a lot of information that's there that just that is just waiting to be mined and and, the, and get the. The, the public to have a conversation around that, that, that information. I think we should be, be doing a lot more. I think we should be lo a lot more, a lot stronger when it comes to interpreting policy. Um, and that is something that, again, where, whether it's ourselves or whether we're getting other people to do so, don't think that we are doing enough to do that. Um, and that's something that we should be actually getting a lot more into our various uh, platforms. And then we should be more proactive <coughs> in charting, in actually offering different visions. We ourselves, I mean, like this, obviously we are not policy makers, but we obviously have opinions about where things should be. And and actually, I think the, the initiative that uh, Alida has taken is something that, that should be replicated uh, in the newspapers, because I think that the, the, the economy actually has to take center stage in, in our discourse. And because we can always chase the Judases of the world forever. And actually, this is what the country will be based on. Um, and just to answer your question about whether we are pro poor or not, I. Okay, so firstly, whether we have a common vision, there cannot be a common vision. We are, Nick did point out that we are. In as much as we love each other, <laughs> now when we get back to our newsrooms, we hate each other, <laughs> <laughs> and we always have a thing. The, the Sunday Times and the Million Guardian they always say, "By, by the way, Friday comes before Sunday." <laughs> <laughs> so I'm mean, like, there is rivalry with, the, with and, and it's great. I mean, look, there, there cannot be a homogeneous um, vision coming from the, the media on on any issue, but there is consensus around, a broad consensus rather, not a caucused consensus, there is broad consensus about a market economy, 
with redistributive um, capacities, qualities, or whatever you, you may call it. I think that there, that, that there is that consensus, and it's a consensus I think that was driven by the government that came into power in 1994. I think it drove the whole society to that consensus, and I think we in the media became part of that consensus. It did not come from Washington. <laughs> yeah, but I think on, in, in terms of pro poor, I don't think we can interpret. You can't say that some that are pro poor or pro rich. Um, we had a discussion earlier on during lunchtime, and it's something that I feel very strongly about that. People often say the media is the mainstream media is elitist, but. Actually, if you actually look at the media and where the, the positions that the, that the media takes, whether the issues such as service delivery, and so it actually takes the side of the poor. I mean, like you don't need to shout from stand on the rooftop and say I'm pro poor. You look at the recent service, de the recent public sector strike. Um, the perspective that was coming through, the victims that were being reflected by the media were the poor, and were technically taking the sides of, side of side of the poor there. So I mean, like, in as much as yes, um, we may be aimed at an urban um, middle class, mostly, most newspapers are. But I think that the, what what you actually see reflected, a lot of it is actually in practice. Pro poor, because we're saying to the government, this is your electorate, and your electorate needs to be serviced in ABC ways. Advertisers will no power over media whatsoever. Advertisers do not tell us what to do, and they do not tell us what ideological direction to take. Um, we write stories, we reflect what is there in the society, we reflect the views that are that appear, I mean, like that are there in the society. There is absolutely nothing that says because Vodacom advertises in the in the newspaper, we will not write a story about uh, Leonard Craig kind of like being nepotistic. To the sun. So there's no such. So I just, I wish we would get oh, get away from kind of like self-perpetuating myths, kind of like which reinforce themselves because it is absolutely not true, and it it, it, it that applies to South Africa as much as it applies to any other media in, in the world. So, um, and we are not. Uh, there was a question over there about ideological. Ideological or ideolo ideological imperatives that somehow what we do is driven by ideological imperatives. We tell stories, and like that is at the end of the day. That's what we do. We tell stories and we provide a platform for different views to be held. And that yes, we will hold our views, and and, and those views will be reflected in the <coughs> editorial columns, and that's there. But the fact that um, one has exposed corruption there because because kind of like. They come from this ideolo ideological perspective. The fact that you have reported the interest rate cut like this because you are of this ide ideological persu persuasion, that, uh, that also does not hold water. I think that, uh, yeah, there are all these myths about the media that pertain. And when it comes to your space for alternative views, um, the space is there. I mean, like, the thing is, like, it, there is no more receptive people to alternative views, to a wide variety of views than newspaper editors. Newspaper editors want to have an exciting bubble of, what you call it, an, an, an exciting festival of ideas in their newspapers. Any editor who does not want that is not an editor with his salt and actually kind of like he would be out of a job the next day because his paper would be dead, would be dead boring.